trend of brevity continues, uh, uh, Mr. Tote, we're going to place you under oath. Yes. Please raise your right hand. Stand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to enter in this case is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Tote, uh, you are sitting between some very experienced trial attorneys. You should consider their counsel uh, in the decision as to whether you wish to become a witness in this case or exercise your constitutional right to remain silent. I want you to understand that at your request, should you choose to remain silent, I would have instructed your jury uh, that they are not to consider your silence in any way whatsoever in rendering a verdict. Ultimately, the decision as to whether you wish to testify in this trial uh, is yours and yours alone. Have you had an opportunity to discuss that decision with your attorneys? Yes, sir. All right. And do you need any additional time to make that decision? Decision has been made, sir. All right. It's been represented to the court that you wish to uh, testify in this trial. Yes, sir. All right, and you understand that uh, uh, the state will have an opportunity to cross-examine you just as they have with any other witness. Do you understand that? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's the only discussion that we have at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Let's return the jury, please. I have that lectern back. You want it up here? I thought that that's where typically they, um, where do you want it, Judge? Okay. I was under the impression that closing arguments were done and you were going to uh, question the defendant from the podium. Is that correct? That closing argument, opening statement. Excuse me, did I say it closing? Okay. Opening statements are concluded. And um, so you can question from this podium and we'll, have, we'll bring Mr. Toad up when the jury returns. Swear him in. I'm fine with that. Thank you. Thank you. Let's return our jury, please. May be seated. Thank you. Defense, you may call your first witness. Your Honor, we call Anthony Tote. <clears throat> Mr. Tote, if you'll uh, please remain standing, we're going to swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to enter in this case is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Please identify yourself. My name is Anthony John Tote. What is your age? Forty six. Mr. Tote. We've heard testimony about a woman named Megan Tote. Are you familiar with that person? Yes. Um, and were you, in fact, married to Megan Tote? Yes. When did you first meet her? It was uh, high school of 1992. And where was that? Uh, in Monville, Connecticut. Sorry. Monville, Connecticut. M-O-N-T-V-I-L-L-E. And did you and Ms. Tote, well, did you and Megan, we've used first names throughout the case, so I'll do it tonight. Um, 
I get hard to hard to remember. Um, did you become married or become a couple? Yes. Now, did both? Did you attend the university in the state of Connecticut? Yes. And where did you go to school? Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut. Did Megan also um, become a student at Sacred Heart? Yes, she was two years behind me. What was your course of study? Undergraduate work, a major in psychology with a concentration in health psychology, um, with a, a declared minor of pre-physical therapy, and then I finished my master's degree of science in physical therapy. Right. Now, did um, your wife, when did you marry Megan? Was that in college or later? I had graduated from college already, and she was in her second to last year of college. What field did she study? She had the exact same credentials as myself, physical therapy. Did you practice in the field of physical therapy? Yes, sir. And are you familiar with medical terms and medical procedures? Most definitely, sir. How long did you, have you, did you practice as a physical therapist? I received my license in August of 1999 and was practicing up until the current. Was Megan uh, also involved in the practice with you? In the practice of physical therapy, sir? Yes. Yes. She, uh, she, whereas I did more hospitalist, nursing care, uh, home care, and outpatient, she concentrated most of her time as a pediatric specialist and did work sometime in nursing homes uh, when we traveled. What were the circumstances that brought your family to Celebration? Initially, my wife and I bought the condo in Celebration in July of 2005 when we were a traveling physical therapist, which means they put us around the country either to cover for what they call snowbird season or people got on maternity leave. They were generally minimum of 13 week assignments, and they could be extended. Uh, we first went out to California, wonderful time. Then we came down to Florida and found that since we bought, we, sorry, since we sold our initial condo in Connecticut, uh, we didn't have any deductions. So we bought the condo in celebration as a partial investment and partially primary home because part of our contract with our traveling company is they pay for our residents. So at the current time, they're paying for a rental. Why have the company pay for a rental when they can pay for your actual house and help with your mortgage payments? So we bought the condo in July 2005. When, would you like me to continue? Let me ask one thing at this point. What was the status of Megan's health when you first met her? When I first met Megan, sorry, I just need to collect myself. Megan had initially been diagnosed as a teen with Lyme disease, in which was, they say Lyme disease goes into remission, they say Lyme disease goes into just recesses and waits another day to invade, all depending on your immune system, all depending on what research shows and who you follow. She also was diagnosed right around middle school, right before I met her, with a heart issue. This heart issue, they diagnosed as mitral valve, uh, mitral valve prolapse and a murmur. They also diagnosed arrhythmias, at which time I found out after I started dating Megan in high school, because I asked her one time, we used to go out to dinner all the time, we used to, you know, normal dating. Ask your next question, Mr. Weston. I'll try and ask you more questions that have a shorter answer. Right? I apologize, sir. Was, um, and then as, when you married Megan, were you, was she, what was the status of her health generally? Generally, she was healthy. She avoided caffeine and she avoided sugars because of the heart issue previously mentioned. And then did there come a time when Megan began to, began to have health problems? Yeah. And about when was the onset of that? March 2011. And what are the conditions that she experienced? We were vacationing. I apologize. We were vacationing in Florida. And we were at a, a theme park. 
and she got hit by a bug. She described this bug as a six-legged black bug with a red um, mark on the back that reminded her of the, of the state of Texas. I didn't see the bug. It was at the end of the day, and this bug bite, which you would think was innocuous, turned into this just this yellow green, I, I can't even describe, pustule. It was a gigantic whitehead. So we went home that night. I went home to the hotel or it was a hotel at the time um, because of the issue. And about what, that was in 2011, you say? March 2011, sir. And then in the ensuing year, did Megan develop any other health complications? Oh, yeah. Through um, many trips to the hospital, many trips to the ER, cardiac critical care units, she was in, diagnosed with a, a multitude of diagnoses, I guess you want to say. First of which was they, they found that she had drug-induced hepatitis. Sorry. First, I apologize. Let me back up. They diagnosed her with um, tonsillar cellulitis. She had these gigantic white pustules on her tonsils. Her lymph node was just totally enlarged and trouble ble breathing. In subsequent visits to the ER, subsequent visits to the doctors, they found that she acquired through the medical aspect what's called drug-induced hepatitis. So her liver became inflamed very much so that it was malfunctioning, um, to put it lightly. Her eyes were, at one point, the color of the most fluorescent yellow highlighter you've ever seen in your life. I swear her eyes could... Objection, Meredith. Mr. Toe? Yes. Did there come a time then on that occasion when she had the hepatitis that it affected her lifestyle or what she could do? Most definitely. My wife, she was a yoga teacher in addition to physical therapist. She went from a very strong, vibrant woman to barely holding on to 90 pounds. She couldn't keep weight on. She couldn't breathe. Her heart rate progressively was going crazy. At rest, it would be 190 or above. EKGs, all that kind of stuff, saw her throwing atrial fibrillations, PVCs, which are, it's basically your heart operates in a synchronous motion, okay? Valves pump on rhythm. Her valves and her, sorry, not valves, her chambers were beating all irregular. Um, it was basically, you take four wheels of a car. Objection, Your Honor, lack of medical knowledge. And narrative. It's a narrative system. Mr. Tobert, have you, um, what medical training have you received in conjunction with the physical therapy? I appreciate you asking me that, sir. 20 years of medical experience working in the hospital, case review of chars, uh, charts, home care, meaning that not only was I operating under a nurse or with a nurse individually at a house, I was also opening cases on my own, which means I received medical information, medical records from the doctors and from the hospital themselves to be interpreted, to be reviewed, and to be deciphered so that I can uh, properly give the appropriate care within their medical limits to the patient. Thank you for that background. Now, as your wife continued with her health issues, what was her attitude or outlook or demeanor? Her demeanor went from a very vibrant young woman in which, literally, we were best friends. As dating, we always knew we would remain best friends. That's how close we were. We dated for eight years before we were married. Her family was my family, okay? Her grandparents were my grandparents. 
That's how close we were. Okay? She went from, even though she remained the light of my life whenever she walked into a room, literally, after almost 20 years of marriage, my stomach would have those butterflies in it, seeing my wife. I existed, but she went from... Ask the question again, Mr. Wilson. Let me, now, at that point in time, did you have children? At the time she got sick, sir? Sorry? At what point in time, sir? When um, we're talking about this period in her life, when she had gone, when she was less vibrant or, or less, uh, yeah. her demeanor changed. Before she got sick, we were blessed with two wonderful boys. Okay? She went from a mom who provided for everything including myself, I consider myself a third kid, okay, to a person who could barely walk stairs on certain days. We hired, with the help and the assistance of our family, we hired a, I guess you want to say a mother's helper, okay, in which to come in, help bring the kids to school, which is something my wife... What I'm going to ask you to do is to try and, and I'll try and correct you to the, that we don't have long extensions so it's easier for everyone to understand what we're talking about. I apologize, sir. It's been two years since I've been able to tell my story. I appreciate you working with you. Do you... You and Megan were attended Sacred Heart, which was a Roman Catholic university. Is that true? That's the debate. It's Roman Catholic by name, but... It, it was considered Jesuit run, which I don't know where the derivation between those two run. But were you raised in the Roman Catholic, in the Catholic Church? I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church and continue to practice as such, sir. Do you know whether Megan was raised in, in the Roman Catholic Church? Megan was raised in the Roman Catholic Church. However, before she went to college, her and her, and her mother and father did shy away from it, but she did get confirmed before we got married. When, as you progressed as a family, did Megan seek other religion, ex religious experiences? Most definitely, sir. And what was the reason for that? When she got sick, we were under the motion, under the model of traditional med. That's where we were trained. Medicine helps. Progression of her disease process, we went more alternative, or she went more alternative, I should say, because we were told to stay away from medications. Alternatives were not working. Through her yoga practice and her yoga certification, she got introduced to, I guess you want to say an Eastern religion, Buddhist and based, or sorry, Hindu and based. I always thought it was Buddhist, but it was actually Hindu. And she shied away from the Roman Catholic Church. And her progression, her religion, through that religion and her following also took over her medical outlook and her medical treatment of herself as she shied away from unsuccessful medical interventions. Around that time, um, was there a calamitous event in the life of Megan's parents? Before, before the birth of my first son. In November of 2002, her father hung himself. She was very close with her father. She was not close with her mom. I was very close with her father. He was my best, he was one of my good friends, one of the few males I trusted. One of the things I totally enjoyed about the relationship with her and her family was her relationship with her father. She was that close with him. All right, sir. And then also, along with having three children yourself with Megan, um, she suffered miscarriages, is that right? Yes, sir. Did that also affect her, um, her approach towards her health or approach towards 
how she carried on day to day? The first miscarriage happened when she first got bit by that bug. And before the whole progression of the disease and the process under it. There was, of course, you know, depression and that kind of stuff for losing a baby. And then in um, the fall of 2019, September actually, we were blessed. Um, we found out that a simple weekend away, we conceived. And she went from being depressed to very happy, dancing, singing, something that I hadn't seen in forever. And uh, we lost the baby. And it affected her big time. And obviously affected me, but she went from that singing, humming, dancing person to not uh, to days that she didn't even get out of bed. What was the religious group that she had uh, migrated towards, the Eastern religion? Did you ever attend their services with your wife? Or I was very supportive of my wife. I did not understand, nor did I follow this religious aspect. I was Roman Catholic. The way I was raised, I was raised in a military family. My stepfather was a very proud military man. I was taught respect. I might... Unresponsive. your question, Mr. Ward. The question that was asked was... Let me, let me ask an entirely different question so we're not, no, no confusion. I want to make sure I tie up some loose ends. You mentioned Lyme disease, and that's somewhat prevalent in New England. Is that correct? It seems like everybody has Lyme disease, yes. And that is transmitted by insects, bugs also, correct? That is correct. All right. And then did that, what were the effects on that of your wife that you noticed? When the Lyme disease came, became apparent and positive, she had breathing problems, heart rate problems, chronic pains. When she had what was called exacerbations, so without getting too technical, your immune system keeps is the best thing to keep any disease at, at bay. So whenever she didn't feel well, didn't, you know, got sick, the, the Lyme would become more prevalent. So when the Lyme became more prevalent, not only did she have joint aches, she had feelings of hopelessness, depression, not wanting to go on on certain days. There were some days where I helped her shave her legs because she couldn't bend over, she was in so much pain or couldn't breathe. Mr. Tote, did Ms. your wife seek a different way to help through the Eastern religion? Yes, she did, sir. And um, was it diet-based or worship-based, or what were, the, what were the parts that appealed to her, and what was she seeking? She was seeking control over her own medical care. Basically, anybody in a chronic illness wants some kind of control of their own self. She went from traditional medicine, she went to realistic, um, religious following of dictating what her health care was. She even followed a book from a guy who listened to a ghost who had no medical experience to tell her what she should be doing, what she should be eating, and that kind of stuff. Called the medical medium. Was there any discussion within that religious group about the, an afterlife? Yes. They, this religious group would could be conducted mostly by Skype or whatever um, video thing it was at the time. I think it was Skype. Objection here, sir. No. I, but the means of technology. Overall. Thank you. I would sit with her during some of these meetings. They would give her prayers to pray, whether for to help with what they were talking about with what was called family lineage karma burning. Because as in the Bible, Roman Catholic, the same thing she followed was the fact that your past, um, what's the word, your, your past family's transgressions 
follow forward multiple generations. So her, as you asked, the, please repeat your question just so I can make sure I repeat correctly. Was there an afterlife component of this, of this religious practice? Yes, there was an afterlife component in which each afterlife, she believed that there was reincarnation. And as they burned the family karma in the current life, they reached a salvation in which they were reincarnated to a better life. And was her desire to seek better health through this process by going into another life? Better health and better relationships with people who had... abused her and had verbally and otherwise affected her in her life. There was some discussion about a suicide note and um, that was apparently directed from Detective Cole Miller to Dr. Nara. Um, were you aware of any suicide note? When I came back to the house that day, she showed it to me, yes. But I had no, no knowledge of it before I came home that day. And what was her demeanor or attitude at that time? She was trying to explain to me what she did. She was trying to make me understand. It was very, the whole aspect of it was she was trying to present this as fact. And I was telling her, I don't believe, that, I can't believe I called her some names, which I never called her before in my life. But the whole demeanor of it was this is what I've been told through my meditations. This is what I believe. This is what, as she referred to as, the light has provided for her and the light. Talking about your own demeanor and what how, your countenance. My own demeanor, when I found out what happened, I puked. I cried. I was in total denial of what happened I couldn't understand and then after that I was like I want to get you help I'll take responsibility for this just get help that's all I wanted I would do anything in my life to do what she needed provide for what she needed provide her a happy life I held my wife on a pedestal I didn't care anything to myself I wanted her a good life Period. And I wanted her to get help. I didn't care. We'll try and work on shorter sentences so that everyone can keep up. And I'll be... My apologies, sir. We're fine. Have you progressed from talking about the afterlife to talk about what happened to your children and your wife? I don't understand what you mean, sir. When you said what had happened with Megan, what were you talking about? What had happened that day when I came home? Which day? I don't know. You don't day. have to talk about calendar day. What was the occurrence that made that day memorable? I came home and my kids were dead. It was the most horrible day of my life. And what I mean more horrible is my wife died in front of me also. Mr. Coat, had there been a, a blueberry pie that was cooked in the house? According to what she told me. Objection hearsay. And a, Hold on just a sec, Mr. Tell response. Describe what you know or saw and not what you heard from another person, if you can. Thank you, sir. When I came home that morning, 
I knew my family the night before was having dessert, and I declined it because you saw my health. I was jogging and losing weight. I came home that morning, and there was a melted purple, looked like a pudding pie. I, I can't really tell you exactly what it was. She told me what it was later, but it was in a graham cracker crust. And the, the kitchen, it was my job to clean the kitchen. But when I came home, that purple, bluish, grapeish, melted pie, I guess you want to say, the pie dish was sitting there on the counter with some residue on the kids, um, that the kids places on their, on their plates. At that time, you came in, you saw that there were desserts that had been served up on the, on the table? I, I saw, saw the remnants of it, yes. And then you did, did you then discover that your children were dead? Not initially, no. I had gone upstairs. Well, I had the, too much information, but I had to pee. So I went to the bathroom and came out, and my wife was at the top of the stairs. My house was very quiet. Very unnormal having three kids. One 13, one 10 at the time, the other one four years old. She brought me in the room. I had been feeling nauseous that morning anyways because I had these shakes I was taking for weight loss, all that. And around the same time that she was telling me I was puking. It was then that I understood what had transpired. She had blood on her shirt. And after that, after I said a few uncolored words to her, I then discovered the kids. I went into the rooms and found them dead. You saw the video yesterday where on the 15th, Cole Miller and another investigator in a tiny room talked to you at length. Did you have an agenda for that discussion? I don't even remember that day. Last thing I remember was falling down the stairs and smacking my head on the stairs, which I resulted in a fracture on my neck. Next thing I knew, I woke up here. And seeing that video yesterday, I don't even, that was the first time I saw that video. I had no agenda consciously, but I can tell you throughout my relationship with my wife, especially after she got sick, I would put myself as a forefront and take responsibility and protect my wife. You said in the statement that you stabbed the children and there was blood everywhere. Do you remember that from yesterday's video? I remember it just seeing on yesterday's video. I wasn't aware of anything I said till about June, so maybe June or July, six months after I got here when I got the transcript of what I said that day. Why did you say that you um, that you performed the knife, the, the incisions on the bellies of the children. It goes back to the aspect is I was covering for my wife. Obviously, unsuccessfully, because as you saw by the video, compared to what they said, I had no clue had my kids died. Did you have ideas of joining your family in the afterlife? After I saw everybody die? Uh, after I saw my wife die and saw my kids? Most definitely. I wanted to be with them. That's the only thing I wanted to be. I didn't care by what means. I didn't care by what anything. I sliced my wrist. I took multiple doses of Benadryl. I tried to hang myself several times. I bought a pellet gun to shoot myself because I couldn't get a gun to, as you call it, eat a gun. 
Did you ever try to um, poison yourself? With Benadryl, yes. And also, I was just under recently of medical care, and I was given metformin for diabetes. And at one point, I swallowed the whole bottle of metformin. Now, I think there was, there was evidence that you remained in the house for up to three weeks after the day that changed your family's entire future. During that time, how many attempts did you make to um, take your own life? I would have to. I would have to go through them to count because in my head I can't count them. Do you mind if I tell you? Can we take a just take a, a close your eyes for about fifteen minutes and I mean about fifteen seconds and try and formulate the answer. Conscious recollection, I can tell you I remember at least eight times. However, since being here and through all the diagnostic testing, I found out there were additional times. So, ten times, at least. And was Benadryl the primary agent that you were um, trying to use? Benadryl was one of the agents. There was also a knife I picked up. I saw my wife stab herself. How hard could it be to stab yourself? You gotta be freaking kidding me. You see a knife with a blade like this and you wanna instill that into your body? No, no way. Um, I chickened out, yes. I tried other means. I tried at least three episodes of, of Benadryl. And did you not keep it down or vomit or what happened? <laughs> Benadryl, as you know, can make you sleepy, okay? The first time I took it, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no plan of this. I just wanted to be with my family. I woke up, I don't know when, how long. Obviously, I didn't take enough. Next time, I took a whole bunch of, um, well, the wall dry. I remember that distinctly because that stuff tastes horribly. But the other... The children's was just no different. It's just a better flavor. I took, a, I think it was, it was equivalent of five glasses about this tall I had prepared. Okay? I fell asleep before I finished it entirely. The last thing of Benadryl, which I took when going back and looking at the dates and whatever, it turned out the day before that they came to my house. I saw, the, I saw the aspect of the 12th on one of the phones. At that time, I took over 200 pills of Benadryl. Now, mind you, a normal dose of Benadryl is two pills. And I took two family-sized uh, liquid Benadryls. In order to stay awake, and also because I was feeling nauseous, I took a Mountain Dew and an energy drink. The energy drink to keep me up because I kept falling asleep and the Mountain Dew so that I wouldn't throw this stuff up. I wanted this stuff in my system. I was so frustrated I couldn't kill myself. In the, in the um, crime scene photographs that were shown to the jury, there was a huffy bicycle in a box. Yeah. And were you prepared to assemble that bike? Oh, God, my, my baby's... That was to be a Christmas present to my daughter. I hadn't picked up the boys' bikes yet because the boys were some of my best friends and I could never say. I went over there that night to... Ask your next question, Mr. Wesley. Did you open the box? Did you assemble the bike? I never made it there to assemble the bike. That's where I went that night to assemble that bike. There are also um, numerous Christmas gifts, wrapped Christmas gifts, that were shown in either the photographs or in the, the inventory that's collected. 
Did your did you and your wife buy gifts and have gifts ready for Christmas for your children? Yes, some of those gifts were ours. New bed set, or, um, not bed set. I apologize. Um, duvet cover and sheets and all that kind of stuff. The boys picked up. There was even a, a dollhouse that we picked up for my uh, my daughter. It was her first dollhouse, and there was also presents there from the family that had been sent down. Yes. Mr. Two, what could have prohibited Megan from killing your children? I have no idea. We woke up that morning, she was pain free. Everything was good. I took the opportunity to try to go over and make up the, make, put the bike together. I had no, I had no knowledge of this. I, I don't know what could have prevented it. I have no idea. And that's the biggest thing that affects me is the fact that I didn't even see this coming. They say, you know, blindsided. This was a blindside by like a Mack truck with, filled with dynamite. Sorry. No, I'm sorry. Collect yourself. Do you have a tissue or something? I'm sorry. Deputies? Do you mind if I turn around real quick? Can I turn right. around? Sorry. Do you remember the religious groups sending messages and having um um I guess prayer or singing sessions in Megan's memory and you know um, information back. I really do not understand that question, sir. I apologize. Was the um, the person who was the, thought to be the leader of this Indian or Eastern Indian um, religious group uh, called Gari? That was one of them. Yes. That was the primary one, yes. And they had individual contact with Megan, would leave messages for Megan and contact her? Yeah, contacts would be via phone, via, um, like I said, the Skype computer thing, um, FaceTimed sometimes. And did they, acknowledge, did they contact you or give you information that Megan had crossed over? They didn't tell me directly. They had contacted my sister, and my sister told me that she had a conversation, that Megan was at rest and she crossed over. I don't know where that, I, I don't understand it. But to hold it in my heart, she crossed over and she's at peace and not suffering. That's all I can hope for. So, did you kill your family? No. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Mr. Wesley. It's been out cross examination. What was Megan's medical conditions? Megan's medical conditions consisted of neck pain, back pain, hypothyroidism, Lyme disease, heart rate issues, breathing issues. 
And did all of these medical issues make her frail? Frail is a very subjective term. Can you please uh, be more descriptive? Sure. Did all of medical, Megan's medical conditions make it hard for her to engage in everyday living? Yes. Did Megan's medical condition make it hard for her to walk? At times, yes, but she hit it very well. So going back to the date that you remember coming home to your family being um, gone, how was Megan walking that day? She was walking fine. She had woken up pain-free the day before because she had told me that the light had interceded and the light had enabled her to do so. Okay, so she was walking around fine. Correct. And did she complain to you at all about, you said she was pain-free so she didn't have to take any medication? She was on a whole list of herbal stuff, some of which I have no idea what she was taking. Plus she took this whole diet thing in which she would boil these mushrooms, in which she would do whole sorts of, there's so many things she would do. Okay, so, so she was engaging in holistic practices. Would holistic and religious and spiritual practice, that's correct. Okay. And... Um, you said that Megan had gotten diagnosed with Lyme disease as a teen. That was her initial diagnosis. That's correct. That it, she had exacerbations. Like I had told you before, the diagnosis... My question was a yes or no question. Let me ask my next question. Well, allow me to elaborate. My question was a yes or no question. That's fine. Thank you, ma'am. After... She was diagnosed, or you were told she was diagnosed with Lyme disease. How long was it before she experienced symptoms? Which time? The first time. I didn't know her when she initially got diagnosed with Lyme. She initially got diagnosed the first time when I was in 2011 and went through exacerbations, up and down cycles, all depending on her condition of her health, condition of her physically, condition of her mentally. Condition of her stress-wise, condition of her emotionally. And did she get diagnosed with Lyme disease as a teen or in 2011? Like I explained before, the, the, I guess you want to say the jury is out of whether or not you have Lyme disease or Lyme exacerbations coming back and forth. Okay. She got diagnosed initially. I don't, you can, I don't have any other questions. Allow me to finish, ma'am. I don't have any other questions about that. Thank you, ma'am. Is it your testimony that from 2011 until December of 2019, Megan was suffering? From 2011 to yes. 2019? Yes. Off and on, yes. But she consistently had all the breathing issues, the pain, and the heart rate issues, all depending on how bad they were and how bad they were affecting her to the day. Prior to the day of the deaths, had Megan been suffering? Most definitely. When was the most recent time that she had been suffering? Like I told you, I woke up that morning. All of a sudden, she was pain-free. The night before, I had worked on her. I had worked on her continuously every day for over a year after she weaned from Zoe. Before she went to bed, when she woke up in the morning to help with her pain so that we can get her to the regular doctors. She had a doctor's visit scheduled for the Thursday after Thanksgiving. Forgive me, I do not have the date in which she canceled because she had said, there's no hope, there's, no, she, there's nothing more that can be done. Okay, so what kind of work did you do for Megan? Did myofascial release, craniosacral, any type of relaxations that... My apologies, ma'am. Manual therapy in which I was trained under, different things I would go to school for, or continuing ed for, in to help treat her. Stuff I've read about, stuff I've gone through, everything within my scope of practice. I'm asking you what you specifically did. So if you were going to treat her, yep. what were the different things that you did? That's what I'm trying to explain to you. Okay? There's no cookbook recipe in physical therapy. It's treating her ailments and treating her pains. Okay, so, so whether you did or that. not, whether or not 
her liver was inflamed. I did myofascial release to help release the liver. She had digestive problems. I would do integrated manual therapy to help with those digestive problems. She had neck pain. I helped with her neck pain. She had relaxation issues and stress issues and heart rate issues and vagus nerve issues. I would help her desensitize that through craniosacral therapy. I would do anything she needed to get done to help her get better, to help her progress in her life. When was the mother helpers hired? The mother's helper hired was initially after Tyler was born to help here and there to bring the kids, bring my oldest son to see school. So that would have been 2010-ish, 2011-ish, but she was upped to more after she got sick to help provide through the assistance of her aunt who helped uh, finance her and ourselves. Okay. At what point was the mother's helper no longer necessary? It was no longer never necessary. She had moved on to another career. We, held, we got another nanny, worker, that kind of stuff, which Megan and her did not get along with. Then she decided that warm weather was better, so she came down here. In many pleas to help get somebody else, we got a babysitter in which you, you, you want to know the whole my, truth. I'm telling you the whole truth. My question, at what point did you not have assisted help? Month point? and year. After year, let's see, we moved down here in 2014. So it's no, I apologize. Nope. Full time was after Zoe, so full time was 2016 she came down here. After that, we had no help because she fired the babysitter that we had. Okay. So was Megan the caregiver for the children during the week? Through so the couple days that I was away, yes. And you mentioned the couple days that you were away. You still had a practice up in Connecticut at the time. We right? had a practice in Connecticut. That's correct. And isn't it correct that you would travel during the week up to Connecticut? That's correct. As long as my wife's issues and her wife's, my wife's health dictated such. There were times in which I would literally land and I would get a phone call from my son or my wife that things are bad and I'd hop on the first flight back. Did that happen often? It happened quite a bit. And when you say things were bad, is this mentally, physically, what are you talking about? All the above, from the miscarriage and bleeding, to the fact of her ripping the shelves off the wall and my boy was scared, to her breaking the dishes, to her not being able to get out of bed. And then as things progressed and I found that my older son was preparing a lot more meals, before I would leave for the couple days I was gone, I would make sure Objection that there was... non-responsive. Ask your next question. You are a practicing, or you indicated you're a practicing Roman Catholic. I am a practice Roman Catholic trying to find, I have a Christian base and migrated to more Christian base. However, I'm trying to find a church that suited me because okay. Roman Catholic law did not. Isn't it true that during your interview with Detective Miller, you indicated to Detective Miller that you were a forced Catholic? Growing up, I was. And at what point in time did Meg, and I'm asking for a year and a month, if you know, at what point in time did Megan begin seeking other religion um, alternatives? In what regards, in what capacity do you speak of, ma'am? You indicated that she initially was Catholic with you mm -hmm. and that she sought other religious alternatives. Well, when me, did she do that? Let me correct your chronology, if you may, may. She came back and got confirmed because we were going to get married in a Catholic church. She was not a, a, a practicing Catholic at the time, except for going here and there and practicing Easter, okay? When she got her yoga certification, she got introduced to this new gallery through one of the things. That was in... When? That was in 2009. After she got sick in 2011, she progressed 2012, 2013 to gallery and Mirabai. You said 2012 and 13? Correct, after she got sick. When did you become aware? When did I become aware of what? That Megan was going towards this alternate religion. When she told me. Initially, she would share her yoga certifications and her courses. 
And then in 2012, 2013, she would have me sit in on her teleconferences or whatever you want to call them. And I saw her progressing further and further away from medical towards the spiritual aspect. Okay. Excuse me for one second. Going to the day that this happened, that um, you said you came home, where were you coming home from? I had decided with my wife's conversation the night before that I would take the opportunity to go over, do some maintenance issues of the condo, and to put together my daughter's bike. Okay, so did you leave the night before or in the morning? The night before the morning of what, ma'am? When you came home and said you found your children dead. I left the night before, after dinner. When? After dinner. What time? Ma'am, I was on vacation. I don't know the time. I can tell you it was after dinner time because we sat there and I had my shake prepared and help le leftovers. I had gone over there and realized that my kids did not put the tools in my van, so I walked back and played basketball with them for a couple hours. Okay, so did you finish dinner first? I didn't eat dinner. My kids finished dinner, yes. Did your children finish their entire dinner before you left? They finished the dinner that was provided with them. I don't know if they ate afterwards. Did you, you said it was your job to clean the kitchen. Did you clean the kitchen? No. So. There's leftovers, we throw stuff away. There's nothing to clean. Okay, so you didn't clean any, I don't understand what your job is to clean the kitchen. If you didn't have Pots, pans, that kind of stuff. Nothing was there because we didn't cook. We had leftovers. Okay. We had, okay. Uh, what's it called? Um, hummus toast. Okay. They had hummus toast. Um, and you said you weren't hungry. Are you I had a shake. I wasn't going to eat at the time. No. Okay. And did Megan eat? You know, I don't know. And did you have one vehicle or two vehicles in Florida? In Florida, one. One. And that was the red van? Yes. Okay. And um, after, how long after dinner did you go over to the condo? After dinner, it's hard to say, 30, 45 minutes after everything was completed. I was like, I'm going to sleep out. I took the condo, I took the van over because I was pre preparing to bring more stuff back from the condo to the house, kids' toys and that kind of stuff. What kind of stuff did you have at the condo? We have a whole second um, residence there. The kids' toys, my daughter's, um, there's, there's a bunch of uh, blocks. The kids wanted some of their books, some of their stuffed animals, some of, this, some of that. Not stuff I wasn't going to carry, so I was going to put it in the van. When you moved to 202 Reserve Place, what did you take with you from the condo? What did we take with the condo? Clothes. Is that it? Maybe some dishware. And um, how long had you, you, you bought the condo in 2005, right? That's correct. When did it become fully furnished? The condo? Yes. Uh, let's see, we bought it in July 2005, maybe August. So, no, I apologize. There was a renter in there, so October. October and, 2005. Okay, so in October 2005, you fully furnished the condo. The condo, that's correct. Did you ever live there full time? What do you mean? Did you ever live at the condo full time? We, my wife and I lived in the condo from October 2005, thereabouts until July 2005, or 2006, when we moved up to have my son in Connecticut, in which we bought that house up there and rented the condo out. Okay, did you ever move back into the condo? Yes. When? Full time, as in after selling the house. We, I think we sold the house in 2017 or 2018 in Connecticut. So but my wife had uh, started snowboarding. I want to say 2014, 2015, and she made it permanent in 2016 or 17. During the time that you rented the condo, did you leave it fully furnished, or did you have renters furnish it? We had renters furnish it. I moved all that stuff back up to Connecticut. And on the night after dinner, is it your testimony that you got in the van and drove over to the condo? Yes. 
And the condo really wasn't that far from 202 Reserve Place, right? No, because of one-way streets and all that, it took me five minutes. Okay. So you get to the condo. What do you do when you get there? I go in the back of the, uh, go in the, back of the car to get my tool bag out that I asked the boys to put in. Realized it wasn't there. So I walked back. Did you ever make it up to the condo? No. Okay. And you tested, so you, what do you do with the van? Left it there because I walked back to get the, uh, get the tool bag in which the, I looked at the boys. I'm like, did you guys forget something? And they looked under the basketball hoop and I'm like, oh, the van was locked. The tools are there. So we wrestled a little bit and they asked me to play basketball. I had a friend who always told me to take every opportunity to play with the kids because you never know when they're not going to play with you. So we played basketball for a while. We played horse. We played a whole bunch of basketball games. For how long? Ma'am, you're asking me, I don't know, sunlight's up longer here? Hour? Hour and a half? I don't know. Okay. Was it still sunny out when you left? There was sun in the sky. I can't tell you what capacity. It was still light outside. Okay. Um, about what time did you usually eat dinner? <laughs> it depended on what activities there were. That night, probably about 5-ish, 5.30. Some nights at 8, some nights at 7. It all depended. Okay. Is it fair to say that you probably, the kids probably ate between 5 and 8? It could have been 4.30. It could have been 4. All depended on activity. If they ate early, we had a later night snack. Okay. So, what happens after you play basketball? I told the boys it was getting late. Megan had told me that she wanted to go to bed early that night because everybody had just gotten over the Christmas, uh, sorry, the, the Stomach bug and didn't want to be sick for Christmas. Okay. So I said, go to your mom. I'm going. Good night. You know, I'm going over. Just remind mommy I won't be home. I'll either be sleeping in the, the condo or the, um, what's it called? The studio apartment above the garage. Because I was a bull in a china closet. You saw how big I was. I was a klutz. Uh, did you often not sleep at home with your wife? Yeah, when I traveled to Connecticut. What about when you weren't in Connecticut? Most of the time I slept with my wife. That night I said I would take the opportunity to go put together my bike, or my daughter's bike, fix the door, garbage disposal, run bleach down the air conditioner, you know, normal maintenance stuff. And she made the, she didn't want me waking her up. Okay. So how do you get back to the condo? I walk. And you, what tools do you bring with you? It was a tool bag full of, there's, um, what they call socket wrenches, wrenches, screwdrivers, a, a gross array of all tools. I had a utility bag. Okay. So you carry the utility bag and you walk over to the condo, right? I walk over to the van. That's correct. So you walk to the van? Yeah. What do you do with the van? I realized the, the phone, when I realized it wasn't the phone, it was an iPod that was lacking the charge. So I went in, knowing I didn't have a charger up in, my, up in the condo, I had a car charger. So I sat in there, decided to take a rest because I was exhausted as I charged the phone. Okay, so how long were you in the van? I fell asleep. What kind of um, phone charger did you have in the van? It's a, a plug into the, um, what's it called? Cigarette lighter thing. Did you have a phone charger back at 202 Reserve Place? Oh yeah, that's where they all were. So how long are you sleeping in the van? I woke up by the sunshine the next morning. Oh. So you slept the entire night in the van? I'm sure I woke up at one point or another and went back to sleep. It was not uncurrent. I used to fall asleep in the um, pickup line to pick up my kids at school. Okay, so did you sleep in the front seat, the passenger seat? Front driver's seat. seat. Front driver's seat, okay. Did you ever go inside the condo? Nope, never made it up there. Because I woke up. And realized the sun was up, so obviously it was later than the 4 o'clock I usually woke up to treat my wife. And I didn't want to be in the doghouse, but with her waking up and being in pain and me not being there and not being able to provide for her. Okay, so what time did you wake up? Sunlight was up. What time sunrise in Florida? So after, do you drive back to 202 Reserve Place or do you walk? I walked. So you, why did you drive over to Longview Avenue in the first place then? As I repeated the first, which was already said, I was bringing stuff back from the condo that were of my kids that they wanted back. Obviously, I'm not going to carry a whole bag of whatever in my hands, so I brought the van to load in all the blocks, load in my, some of the kids' my Lego, their Lego toys, bring back some of the stuffed animals. Okay. 
So, you get back, and now it's daylight. The sun is up, yes. And which door of the house you go into? Back door. So you go in the back door, and what do you do? Go to pee. Okay. After I walk through the kitchen and saw the remnants of everything. Okay. So you see everything still on the table. You walk. You pass the bathroom to go upstairs, right? No, I went to the bathroom downstairs. Okay. I thought earlier you testified that you went upstairs to After go to the bathroom. After I went to the bathroom. What I testified was I went to the bathroom, then went upstairs to meet my wife. Okay. So at what point did she come to the top of the stairs then? When I came out of the bathroom downstairs, she must have heard motion. She was at the top of the stairs. Okay. So... Um, were the doors to the library open or closed? Don't know. Didn't see them. Is the library not close to the stairs? The library is past the stairs. That's correct. But when you have to pee, you have to pee. Well, you're standing at the bottom of the stairs looking up at Megan at the stairs. You can't see the doors to the library? Ma'am, can you see that gentleman back there? Mike, you don't ask me questions. I ask you questions. Can you see the door to the library when you're standing at the stairs looking up at Megan? No. Okay. And you're engaging with Megan, and what is Megan's demeanor? Not what she says. What is she doing, and how is she appear to you? She's standing at the top of the stairs. She has tears in her eyes and said, you're alive. Okay. And what is she wearing? She's wearing my gray HydroWorks shirt, which is something she usually slept in. And she's wearing some kind of pants of some sort. She had clothes on. And did she have any injuries at that point? Ma'am, I, she was standing there. She was fine. I don't know. I hugged her, kissed her, told her, I'm sorry I'm late. Okay, so what were. happens next? I go into the bedroom because I wasn't feeling well, and she wanted to, be, to talk to me in the bedroom. Okay, and what happens next? We start communicating, and like I said, when I woke up, I felt nauseous anyways. And I don't know if it was because of the nauseous I woke up with or what she was telling me. I puked. Okay. And where, so are you in the master bathroom? That's correct. And where's Megan? You know, she's somewhere behind me. So you don't know? She's talking within voice distance. I can't tell if she's this distance away or she's this distance away. Is she in the bathroom? Like I said, I can't tell. You're asking me specific. She's in the room someplace. So if you don't know, your answer is, I don't know. Can you, do you know, do you know if Megan's in the bathroom? I do not know if the Megan's in the bathroom. Okay. But Megan is talking to you. That's correct. And after you're done in the bathroom, where do you go? Do you want the whole chain of events or do you want... Which room of the house do you go into after you leave the bathroom? So I go into my master bedroom, then walk through the door into the hallway and walk into Zoe's room. And is Alec and Tyler's door open? That I don't recall, ma'am. I'm sorry. Why did you go to Zoe's room? Because she said she... She said the kids were dead. And Zoe was my little angel. That's the first one I went to. So when you get into Zoe's room, what do you see? There's a pillow on her head. There's a hand. And there's covers on top of her. She's laying on her mattress on the floor. Look, the mattress is on the floor. She's laying on her mattress. What do you do? I went over to her. I uncovered her, her mouth, uh, uncovered her face with a pillow. She had told me that she had stabbed the kids. So, of course, I looked for blood. I looked for anything. I looked for any sign of life. There was nothing. I turned back to her and I said, I thought you stabbed her. She says, I thought I did. I didn't know. It bounced off of her. Okay. So, after you discover Zoe, what do you do? I went to the bathroom and picked up a washcloth. Her mouth was open. Her eyes were open. She looked uncomfortable. It's my normal demeanor to help put my kids in rest. Don't ask me why I did it. I was trying to close her eyes. Okay. So... Where's Megan when you're doing Somewhere this? behind me. She was following me, talking to me. At one point, she was standing in the doorway, talking to me from 
the doorway to me because I was asking her. I, thought, I said, I thought you stabbed the kids. Okay. So did you, you said you had charged your phone the night before. Did you have your phone? I said I plugged it in and attempted to charge. Little did I know that the charger was not a direct charger. It had to have the engine on. The, the battery never charged. And I also found out that phone wasn't an active phone. That was an active, that was a phone that we used for things. So no, it was not charged and it was not a technical phone. Okay. Did, were there other phones in the house? There were other possessions of phones in the house, but Megan hid them and would not tell me where she hid them. So it's your testimony that you could not have called anybody. That's correct. I didn't have a phone. And it's daylight, right? Yep. Okay. Is it during the week? Is it on the weekend? It's on a day that the sun was up. I do not know the days. The only, the only isolation of days I've been given is from a receipt that I saw up there. Okay. So you, my question is, is it during the week or during the weekend? So your answer is what? A day that sun was up. That's all I know. Okay. And... After you finish with Zoe, what do you do? Megan was standing there trying to plead with me to talk. She kept bringing up the story of Thomas, the disbeliever, because she wanted me to believe what she was doing. Brushed her out of the way, and I went to Alec's room. And who was in Alec's room? Alec. Where was Tyler? Tyler was found downstairs. And was Tyler in the library? Yes. So Alec, which bed was Alex? Alex was the one, when you walk into the room, you walk in from the door, you have a, a square bookcase headboard thing. His was the one on this wall. Tyler's was the one on that wall. Okay. And what did you find in Tyler's room? Or in Alec's room? In Alec and Tyler's room. Yeah. Alec was on his back, pillow over his head, covers over him, and there was blood. How much blood? Enough that I noticed. I can't really tell you because I pulled back the, the blankets. The shirt had some blood on it, and there was blood on the abdomen. Was there blood on the blankets? Didn't, didn't inspect it. My goal was to see if they were alive. And my goal is to see what the hell happened. Okay. My language. So after you see Alec, do you go downstairs to Tyler? No, I actually do the same thing with the washcloth. His eyes were open and his mouth was gently slack, looked uncomfortable. Normal father thing is to relax their head and relax. And I was just providing them comfort. Okay. So after you do this with Alec, where do you go? Tyler. Okay. I confirmed with Megan that Tyler was downstairs, once again brushed her aside as she's trying to convince me to see things in her light. I told her to leave me the hell alone, and I went down the stairs. Okay. Do you immediately go into the library? I opened the door to go into the library, yes. So the library door was closed? That I found out when I went downstairs, yes. So um, there's a couch in the library, right? Yeah, among shelves and a carpet and some toys, yes. I'm just talking about the couch. Is that couch a pull-out couch? Yes, it is. So when you go in there, is the couch pulled out? He's sleeping on the bed at a pull-out couch, yes. And what do you find with Tyler? Tyler's on his back, hand out to the side, blankets over him, pillow over his face, and there's, when I remove the blankets, there's blood there. Okay. And do you do the same thing with a washcloth with Tyler? Unfortunately, I didn't go to the bathroom to, to what's it called, refresh it. It was just on me. Okay. And where's Megan? She's, at that point, standing at the library door, pleading with me to talk. At, at that point, did Megan have anything? She has some kind of, uh, we have metal glasses, uh, sorry, cups. She's had that and she was drinking something. When this is all happening and after you finish with Tyler, where do you go? Megan at that point had gone up to the bedroom already, and I went up there and told her she needed to get help 
I don't care what happened. I don't care what she did. Get help. I will take responsibility. I will do whatever it needs. Please go to the hospital. Tell me where the phones are. Because I'd asked her for the phones where initially. Mm -hmm. And she goes, I'm not telling you. Okay. And this, this conversation is happening where? In, in the master bedroom. In the master bedroom. Okay. And where is Megan at when you're having this conversation? Throughout, fluid throughout the bedroom and the bathroom, going back and forth. At one point, I went into the bathroom because there was a Benadryl bottle on the floor. And I went into the bathroom and found a garbage bag in which I threw the, um, the Benadryl away as I'm looking for the phones. Okay. And is Megan just kind of walking around? Is she following you? What is she doing? At that point, she's standing at the side of the... When I left her to go throw the Benadryl bottle away and look for phones, she was standing at the side of the bed. On which side? On her side. On her side of the bed. So that would be the right side, right? If you're looking from the foot of the bed, that is correct. Okay. And um, does she still have this cup in her hand? The cup is being up to herself, back down. When I left, the cup was still in her hand. Where did you go? Into the bathroom. So you're in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Are you at the vanity? Are you in the little stall where the toilet is? Are you in the closet? Where in the bathroom are you? I'm bouncing around all the place, in the closet and around looking for the phones. Okay, so you're looking for the phones. You're not using the bathroom. At that point, no. Okay. And Megan is within the master bedroom, master bathroom. No, she's in the master bedroom. She's in the master bedroom. Mm -hmm. So when you're standing in your master bathroom, can you see in the bedroom? I can see partial in the bedroom. Okay. What part of the bedroom can you see if you're in the master bathroom? As shown on the, the photos, if I may reference that. Yeah. I could see the, the green chair and the, uh, what are they called? My mom used to call it a hope chest, but we had a... The chest at the foot of the bed? Yes. Okay. So you're... Um, you can see that view from the bathroom. Can, is Megan within your view? No, she's standing by her end table. When I left her, she's standing by the end table on her side of the bed. Okay. And how long are you in the bathroom? Don't know. A few minutes. What happens when you come out of the bathroom? As I'm walking out of the bathroom, I hear a sound that is similar to a balloon. You know, like you rub a balloon, like a... Mm -hmm. At which point, I poked my head out you know, as we were coming out, and I see her laying on her back, stabbing herself. Okay. Where at? Is she in the bed? Is she She's on laying floor? on her back, on her side of the bed, with her head on the pillow, laying on her back, on top of sheets, with the knife in her abdomen. Okay. What color was the knife? The knife was the only knife that was there. It was a green buck knife that I bought for the kids as a Christmas present as part of their fishing lures. Okay, so she has a green knife. That's correct. Um, is she right-handed or left-handed? Green-handled knife. Green-handled knife. Is she right-handed or left-handed? She's right-handed. And which hand was on the knife? Both hands were on the knife. Both hands were on the knife. Yes. And you said that the knife was in her abdomen? Yes. When you came out of the bathroom? Yes. What did you do? Um, I stood there in shock. And I said, what the hell are you doing? And at that point, she says, I'm doing what I did to the boys. I'm trying to get my inferior vena cava. I'm sorry. She said, I'm doing what I did to the boys, trying to get my inferior vena cava. Did you go for help? I went over to my wife and pleaded for her to tell me where the phones were. She asked me not to leave her. She did not leave the boys. So my question is, did you go for help, yes or no? The answer is no. After Megan dies, how long, what do you do? What do you do? Well, we skipped over quite a bit there. I don't know if you want to go through everything or not. What did you do after Megan died? What did I do? I yelled out the window to see if anybody was around to help. There was some weird sound coming from her mouth. I thought she was breathing. I started CPR after I wiped her mouth off with that gray pillow. Okay, so you... She's, she stabs herself once or twice? Like I said, before, she stabbed herself a cumulative times of twice. Okay. And these are right after each other? That is no. Okay, so what happens? She stabbed herself the first time. I sat there pleading with her to allow me to find the phones, 
to allow me to leave her to go get help. My loyalty is to my wife. She did not want to be alone. I thought if I stood there, she said she was going through the inferior vena cava. I have medical experience to know that one of those major arteries will bleed out quickly. In the area of the house, we liked the house rental because there was no one around. Neighbors weren't there. Most of the neighbors around us were snowbirds. If I left her, I thought she was going to die. I thought in my decision making, the best chance was for her to tell me where the phones were. At one point, I hate to say I annoyed her. I was trying to convince her, trying to talk into her language, saying obviously the universe doesn't want you to go. She says, I want to be with my kids. I need to be with my kids. So I leave. Objection, non-responsive. What do you do after Megan dies? Like I said, I yell out the front window of our bedroom for anybody. Help, 202, please. I don't know where the phones are. I hear some kind of weird breathing, some kind of weird air exchange, something. No heartbeat. They never went over that in CPR class. But you know what? I was trying anything. So I started... CPR, chest compressions, and when I didn't see her breathing, I would do mouth compressions. I didn't care about the blood. I didn't care about all that. What do you do after this? At what point are you referencing? What do you do the rest of the day? It's the morning, what do you do the rest of the day? I literally broke down there and cried. Don't ask me how long, because I have no idea how long. I was in a state of confusion. I was going to say whatever. I couldn't help my wife pass. I felt a failure. I wasn't there the night my kids were died. I felt a failure. I decided that I wanted to be with my family, that I wanted to die, that I deserved to die. I condemned myself to death. I was ashamed. What did you do? I sat there and cried for a while. At some point that I realized now after seeing the receipt up there, I decided I was going to go and get a gun. At some point, as the receipt said, on 12-18, I went and purchased that first pellet gun. After I inquired about purchasing a gun to find out that there's a three-day rule in Florida. I've never purchased a gun before. I purchased that gun, which was a gun, a pellet gun, that I was planning to give my kids, my boys, a Christmas present with. What I left kind of and gun, came back. What kind of gun were you trying to buy? Any gun they would sell me. Did you try and buy a shotgun? No, I tried to buy, it was a hand, I was trying to buy handguns. I inquired with them. I inquired on a specific model. I said, I've never bought a gun before. How do I go about buying a gun? Are you aware that the wait period doesn't apply to a shotgun? Damn, I've never bought a gun before. Well, you inquired about buying a gun, right? I inquired about buying a gun. So, this trip to Academy happened after everybody in your family was dead. That's correct. So, on 12-18, the day of that receipt, everybody in your family was dead. That's correct. And was everybody in your family alive for the awards banquet on December 14th of 2019? That was the Saturday, correct? It was the day of the awards, the day that Alec and Tyler got awards. Yes, they were both, yeah, they were both attendants. They played the recital. Okay. So, how soon after their deaths did you go to Academy? Well, if that was the 14th, I went the 18th, so that was four days later. So, when did they, how soon after they died did you go to Academy? I don't know timeline. I know sun was up, and I went over could it have been the same day? Most likely. Okay. So, did, did you go anywhere else besides Academy? On that day? Between December 18th that day and January 13th, where did you go? I went to CVS for Benadryl. How many times? I think twice. I also went to Walgreens. 
for Benadryl for that wall dry. How many times? Well, considering wall dry was disgusting, only once. That I remember. Did you go anywhere else? I picked up a food, a glumky, one night at Publix. Anywhere else? Not that I recall. Did you go to Sarasota? No. There was no way I could drive to Sarasota. Did you leave your phone at a Starbucks in Sarasota? If I didn't go to Sarasota, I didn't leave my phone. So you're denying that you went to Starbucks in Sarasota? In Sarasota, that's correct. And you, you, so you never went to the beach in Sarasota? Nope. It was over two hours away. There was no way I could drive. And you did see the interview that was played yesterday, right? Correct. I did see the interview. And you did speak with the detective more than one time, right? That's what they tell me. You're denying this knowledge? I am. I don't even remember talking to the interview that day. So, you don't remember talking to the detective on January 15th of 2020? Last thing I remember was falling down the stairs and saying, you hold on to somebody in custody, deputy. Next thing I knew, I woke up in jail and thought I was in purgatory with the red floor and the bright sky. Okay, so, um, you discussed a lot of information, wouldn't you agree, in the January 15th, 2020 interview? From what I saw, yes, and from what I read, yes. And you adequately discussed Megan's health conditions that you were aware of, correct? Correct. The ones that she suffered for the previous eight years with, yes. And you also spoke about various uh, trips to Academy. That's what I said, yes. And you went to Academy at some point as well to purchase a longer knife? That's correct. And isn't it true that you also said in, in the um, interview, you spoke about the note that was left? That's correct. And you told law enforcement that you printed it after Megan's death? Correct. And you testified here today that that wasn't true? That's correct. And that wasn't the first time you told that to law enforcement, was it? Well, actually, let me correct, your, let me correct the, the facts on that case, please, if you may. The initial note was the one I didn't print out. The note I found in my pocket after, which is the note Meg printed out, that I found in my pocket after I urinated myself in the, in the garage after one hallucination and drank what I thought was coffee, but I'm pretty sure it was motor oil. I went into the house, stripping, and found the note in my pocket. Which note? The note Megan had left. What was on that note? On that note was essentially, I didn't read this note, but from what I recall, it said we did it to the family, which she referred to as family lineage. I had a different relationship, a different definition of family. And the other thing was where she wanted her ashes. At the bottom of that note, it said, Tony, I love you forever. Please forgive me. What did you do with it? What did I do with that? Yeah. I took it out of my urine-soaked pants and retyped it because I wanted... The, I wanted my res residual family, or my leftover, fa the family that was alive, to keep the knowledge that we were a family unit, and I wanted my wife to know, I want my wife's wishes known where she wanted the ashes buried. She wanted to be buried with her father, where we released the ashes at Harkness. Was Megan's note handwritten or typed? It was typed. And... Did you ultimately throw it away? I ultimately put it in the, there was a fan box in the kitchen. I, after I typed it, and I typed a second one that was, sorry, when I retyped it, there was some errors in it, so I put the urine soaked one and the one with errands in it in that fan box. After I fixed the door with my father-in-law who died in 2002. So, was this the same day that you came home? No. That this note was, that you, when did you find this note? When did I find the note in my pocket? Yes. After I woke up after one of my suicide attempts of Benadryl that I ended up in the garage. I can't tell you, sometime after Christmas. Was this, 
No, in a pair of pants, in a shirt. It was in, in my black pants. shorts. In your shorts? Yeah, the one of two pairs that don't even fit me. Okay. So you only had two pairs of shorts that fit you? I had two pair of black shorts and a pair of khaki shorts. And how often did you wear these shorts? When I went back to, oh, sorry, I had a pair of umbro shorts too. But those are the two dress shorts I had. So how often did you wear them? Um, daily. And you never discovered this note in your pocket before? Ma'am, I can't tell you I changed. You saw the condition of my hair. You saw the condition of my face. I can't tell you what I did. I was on autopilot. Okay. So you actually, the note that was left on the green chair is something that you actually authored. I actually edited it. That's correct. Okay. And you printed it out. That's correct. And you left it on the green chair. Actually, I gave it to my mother who was sitting in the green chair for her to read. Your mother was there? Oh, my mother was there. My father-in-law that died in 2002. My aunt that died in 2013. Um, quite a few people were there. Okay. So, in your interviews, you describe in detail how you take the lives of each one of your children, correct? That's what the video showed, yes. And you indicated in the video that you began with Zoe, correct? That's correct. And that you went in, this was after you and Megan had an agreement and you spoke about various websites and all of this research that you did and you're sitting here today saying that that's not the case. That is not the case. Megan told me the order she killed the kids. Okay. Megan did research, would send things over. Did I research? Yes, I researched for years on my wife's illness. Okay? Now, as you're aware of through your experience, people believe they're Hitler. Did you conduct any research that you told detectives that you conducted? On which subject, ma'am? Did you go to Quora.com? Yeah, that was a normal website I went to. And did you Google different knife techniques? Yes, because I had under my suspicion that the fact, well, I found the website on Megan's phone after I initially found that, after I, initial, after I found the phones, and I also looked up other ways to kill myself. I'm and my question now is, did you watch numerous videos about going to the afterlife? I watched numerous videos with my wife about alien and her alien, um, what's it called? I don't want to call it an infatuation, but she believed in UFOs, aliens. Those are the videos. I've never seen a video about her afterlife. I've only... So everything that you told the detectives, the multiple times that you spoke to them, is not true. Number one? Don't yes or no? What you told detectives about you conducting the research with Megan and watching all of these videos on the afterlife is not true. Yes or no? I did not watch videos on the afterlife. And is it true that the multiple times that you spoke to detectives, that you told detectives that you went into Zoe's room, you gathered the courage, and you rolled over on top of your daughter until she suffered? Isn't you know, that what you told law enforcement? Is this a yes or no question? Or do you want the yes answer? Yes or no question. That is what the video, yes, showed you. And your testimony here today is that Megan did it. Megan killed Zoe. And you told the detectives multiple times that after Zoe, you went to Alec's room. And Alec is your oldest, was your oldest son, correct? That's correct. And Alec was 13 years old, and he was the strongest, right? That is incorrect, ma'am. Who is the strongest? Tyler is downstairs. Okay, so you go to Alec's room next because Alec's upstairs. That's correct. Right? And you told law enforcement on multiple occasions that you went into Alec's room and you stabbed Alec and you suffocated Alec. Isn't that correct? That's partially correct. And isn't it true that you initially told law enforcement multiple times 
that Megan was in there during that killing. That's what the video showed, yes. And isn't it true that you also told law enforcement that Megan took part in the killing? That's what the video showed, that's correct. And that in fact, Megan held Alex's legs down while you suffocated Alex. That's what the video showed, that's correct. And your testimony today is that that is not true. My testimony today is the fact that Megan killed her kids and killed herself. Okay, so next, you told law enforcement that you went to Tyler's room. No. Well, actually not library. Tyler's room. You went to the library. That's correct. Right? And that you had to be fast when you um, killed Tyler, correct? Most definitely. He was the fastest and strongest kid. So he's the fastest and strongest kid, and you told law enforcement that you were afraid he was going to get away, right? That's what Meg told me, yes. That's not my question. You told law enforcement oh, yeah. multiple on the video. times that Tyler was fast and he was... You saw the video, and you saw the video also of saying, I said things that have been proven incorrect. That's not responsive to my question. Actually, it is. But yes or no. You didn't say yes or no, ma'am. Yes apologize. or no. Thank you. Did you tell law enforcement that you had to kill Tyler quickly because he was the fastest? That's what I told you law enforcement. That is correct. And you also told law enforcement, yes or no, that Megan had to stand on the other side of the door just in case. That's what the video showed. And after you were done with Tyler, you and Megan go upstairs or you meet Megan in the master bedroom and you console yourselves, right? Yes or no? That's what the video showed. And you actually told this to law enforcement multiple times. It's not just what the video to told, correct? Ma'am, video, that's what I said. I don't remember anything after I left the house till I got to jail. So I'm refuting, I'm, I'm going on your premise that that video is correct. Okay. Well, that is you in the video, right? It's a sickly version of me, yes. It's an and emotionally disturbed video of me, yes. And that's you talking, right? That is me talking, that's correct. Okay. Thank God so, I didn't tell you I assassinated here's Kennedy. No question. So after that, you tell law enforcement yes or no mm -hmm. that you and Megan get Breezy, the dog, to come up onto the bed, correct? That's what the video showed. And that at that point in time, you suffocated Breezy and took Breezy's life. That's what the video showed. The truth of the matter is, the only thing I saw... There's no the, question. You didn't answer yes or no, so I said no. So, yes or no, it was after this that you told law enforcement that Megan decided that she had to go next, and she stabbed herself, right? I don't know the rules to this question, ma'am. Can you repeat it, please? Sure. Yes or no, the next thing that you told law enforcement happened was that Megan needed to kill herself, and she stabbed herself, right? By what the video showed? Yes. And you were present or at home when Megan stabbed herself two times? Correct. And that you tried to... You actually testified in the video, and you told law enforcement that you tried to help Megan bleed out more quickly by doing these different physical therapy techniques. I didn't see that in the video, ma'am. So you didn't tell law enforcement that? Ma'am, you were asking me on the video what I, I said. I said, did you tell law enforcement? Which point? At any point, did you tell law enforcement that you tried to help Megan bleed quickly so that she would die by doing your physical therapy techniques? Can I tell you what I told the law enforcement by the transcripts that have been provided for me? What'd you tell law enforcement? I told them I provided myofascial release to okay. help facilitate blood flow. It's a technique that you do not do. It's a technique that I did over her liver to help her with digestive issues. You do not do myofascial release to help blood flow. It doesn't help blood flow. Okay. Isn't it true that you told law enforcement that at some point you took a pillow and put it over Megan's head until she suffocated? That's what the video showed, yes.
Tyler's birthday? 12-30-2008. And he would have been 11? Yes. And based upon your testimony and, and the statements that you made to law enforcement, he was dead before his birthday, right? Yeah, before Christmas, that's correct. Okay. And did Tyler get um, like birthday cards or anything from family? Sure. They're you very good at that. You don't remember? There's a lot I don't remember, ma'am. Do you remember cashing a check that was for Tyler's birthday? And um, I have no further question. Thank you. Be direct. Mr. Toad, who killed your family? My wife killed her kids. And you were not involved? No. Nothing further. Thank you. Mr. Toad, you may step down and join your attorneys at council table. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our lunch recess. As always, please do not discuss the facts of the case with anyone. Please do not conduct any independent research. Please discontinue watching or reading any media uh, reports or any information that you may receive outside of the courtroom. Uh, we will resume at 1.30 with the uh, case. 1.30 this afternoon. Have a pleasant lunch. Thank you. All right.